بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد ما brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah, how was your night in i'tikaf? Who here is performing i'tikaf? Most of you, right? Mashallah, very good. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it, uh, accept your efforts, and accept the efforts of all those that are also not uh, performing i'tikaf this year. Obviously, not everyone can do so, uh, especially living in this type of society, subhanAllah, when you have work and uh, you know families to look after, it becomes a little bit difficult. And the family aspect should be easy, but the work is uh, sometimes a little too, uh, a little too restricting. So we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to make it easy for each and every one of us, at least once in our life, uh, to have the ability to perform the i'tikaf, inshaAllah. So we'll continue today uh, with Surah Fusilat, and I will try to finish. Inshallah, I should finish earlier than yesterday. Uh, because I want to use uh, that time, maximize that time, inshallah, for making dua. Uh, There's the last few moments of the day of fasting, uh, so we should encourage each other, inshallah. So hopefully we finish uh, about, you know, just under 10 minutes uh, before the adhan, inshallah. Ta'ala. So we'll continue with Surah Fusilat from, we left off at verse, uh, roughly around verse number 40. Uh, we'll continue from 49 onwards. We'll also go into uh, Surah uh, Ashura and Surah Zukhruf and Ad-Dukhan as well as uh, Jafia. So we're going to cover a lot today uh, in terms of numbers of surahs, but it's not anything more than what we normally cover, inshallah, simply because it's one juz, uh, but the surahs are getting much shorter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us here in verse number 49. We'll start with verse number 49. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights how when we face hardships, right, when we face hardships, it is obviously as we mentioned time and time again, it's a time where people will turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Turn back to the remembrance of Allah and ask Him for what we need. But Allah mentions here that when we face hardships, we feel life will never be good again. As though, you know, I was trying to come up with, with some sort of idea or, or an example of how Someone goes through a difficult moment in life and they feel that nothing's going to be the same ever again. And uh, I initially came up with work, right? Someone has an amazing job and all of a sudden they get laid off. The company lays them off, you notice the gas prices start to go down, everyone is extremely happy, but the person who works in the oil and gas industry now feels the crunch, right? And so they get laid off. And they think, subhanAllah, I've been getting paid extremely well for a long time, for quite a few years, and now all of a sudden, I have no job. Right? You went from making hundreds of thousands a year to making nothing. And, you know, I was talking to a brother when, when this happened a few months ago. Uh, SubhanAllah, it was just not long after I came back from Fort McMurray, where we know all the people are making loads of money in Canada, right? That's where if you want, if you want quick cash, you go to Alberta and you'll make some quick cash. And so, subhanAllah, I was talking to this brother who said, you know, a lot of people that he knows went out there, they moved, they left from Toronto and went out to Alberta, especially Fort McMurray in that area, the northern part, to work in the, the sands and make money. And all of a sudden, they laid off, in one day, 25 or 26,000 people. Like in one day, they just announced we're going to be laying these, these people off. Now imagine how that person feels. And then they look at their salary of about 200 or 300,000, that they went from like 50,000, 60,000, you know, living over here. I know some people in Montreal who their yearly salaries are no more than 30, 35,000, and then they go out there and they start to make 150, 180, $200,000 in one year. And then it just increases. And then all of a sudden you get nothing. You're laid off. What do you do? You move back to your city. And you go on unemployment. And you're making no more than what, $2,000 a month if anything, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us in the Qur'an how sometimes people are faced with, with hardships and difficulties and they feel as though the world is over, that's it. They're never going to experience goodness on, you know, uh, throughout the rest of their life. That they experienced such high levels of, of goodness that now subhanAllah it's gone and it's taken away from them. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach us that if we simply turn back to Him, we can have so much more than that. We can have so much more. And it's also an example for us that, 
Remember yesterday we said sometimes hardship is a blessing, right? Hardship is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it makes us recognize the difficulties that we're going through and that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the good times and He's the one that gives us the difficult moments and He can restore the good times again. Just as we were discussing yesterday, again, this is highlighted here in these verses, that a person can be experiencing extreme amounts of, uh, of sadness and sometimes even become depressed and go through anxiety attacks and you know, feel all the stress and pressure of life and society. But SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gave us the position that we were in. Like we didn't always have that high position. We didn't always have the, the, the income and the earnings that we, that we currently have. And it could possibly happen that it dips a little bit, that it goes down. And I remember, subhanAllah, last year I was working in you know, a different position. I moved back from Malaysia to Canada. And I sort of kept that foreign <coughs> position when I lived over here, when I moved back. But that only stayed for you know, a few months. So I had a job for a few months. And then I decided, you know what, this is not what I want to do. It's not what I want to do. I want to do something totally different. I want to get more into teaching rather than sitting and doing a management type of position. And so I decided to make a change. And that change came with a price tag. Now that was my decision. Not everyone has that decision. Not everyone can budget and plan. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you realize you go to the doctor and they tell you, hey, your whole life is turning upside down. Or you wake up in the morning, you go to work just like every other day, and you realize when you get there, there's a notice, you've been laid off, you only have a month left to work, or two months left, and that's it. Your whole world turns upside down. And so I remember last year when I made that decision, I literally was you know, coming back to a new country, technically, because I hadn't lived in Canada for 12 years, and all of a sudden I decided to make this decision, and my wife's like, are you sure you're making the right choice? I'm like, yeah, I'm making the right choice that's going to make me happy. But I got to choose that cut in my paycheck, right? I, I took literally a one-quarter uh, cut from my, from, my, from my regular salary that I would normally would get by putting a few things together, teaching here, teaching there, and so on, and one quarter out. And my wife's like, are you sure? I'm like, inshallah, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. I'll be much happier. I'll have more time to spend with the family. You know, I'll just, everything's going to be good. It's not about the money, it's about the time. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always will fill that gap in, in whatever it is, whether it's a gap in terms of finances, a gap in terms of your time, a gap in terms of a loss of someone, a family member in the family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always fill it with something that is so much better. And we see that. We see you know, people who their families, mashallah, they, they are the ideal family. You look at them and you think, wow, mashallah, we want to be like them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them. Sometimes with the loss of a family member, someone who dies young, the child might even die. And people think, subhanAllah, how, how can this happen? Such a beautiful family, such a perfect family. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them. And then you notice their family only becomes even stronger because of the test that they've been given. Why? Because they trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who had given them the joy and the happiness, had taken away part of it only to restore more because of their trust and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that highlighted here in these verses of the Qur'an. <clears throat> we move on to the next surah, insha'Allah ta'ala, uh, which is surah number 42. Who knows what surah it is? Surah Ashura. Ashura. What is surah? When we make mashwara, right? What does that mean? Right, consultation. We consult with the people that are around us. So it shouldn't be a one-man show. Even though there's one person that is the leader, that leader should consult with the people around them. Sometimes if the leader wants to make a decision based on their own knowledge and ability and capability, they, they could do that, but they should still ask the opinion of others. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless their thoughts and ideas with something that would be said by uh, the, the, the few people that they consult with. But at the same time, it is from our deen and from the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, to consult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that here in the Qur'an, that he even names a surah of the Qur'an, a shura, consultation. So it's important to, uh, to consult and to be people who consult others as well as, uh, like we seek consultation, so we seek someone else's advice, as well as we should be people that give advice. And a point to highlight with regards to advice is that whenever someone comes to you for consultation, they come to you seeking advice, we should give them the advice 
that they need to hear. The advice that they need and deserve and not the advice that they want to hear from you. And people try and do this all the time, with me in particular. Right? They come and they say, okay, Sheikh, what about this? What about that? What about this? Can I ask you a question? Question about this? Question about that? And then you'll notice they've asked like five or six other people this question. And then they'll go and ask another five or six people the same question. And then they'll look at the, the spectrum of ten people or five people that they asked and say, hmm, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which one of these sounds best to me? Right? And so we shouldn't do that in our deen. You can consult. Consult and that's good. But whenever someone comes to you and they're asking a question, give them the information that they need to know, that they need to know, and not the information that they want to know. So if it's a friend that comes and asks a question, the exact same question that someone else would come and ask me that isn't a friend. The answer, if the scenario, the casing is exactly the same, the answer should be the same as well. It shouldn't differ because that person is a friend, or that person is someone I know, or I know their situation personally, or I, I think this might happen because of their situation because I know them. Well, if that's the case, then there should be reasoning why the answer differs, right? So we should be very careful when we seek advice. Don't seek advice and constantly do so, and a lot of people do this on the internet. They go and they seek advice from a hundred different resources, right, or sources. Just searching for answers and answers and answers simply because they haven't found the right one yet, the one that suits what they feel most, most comfortable with. And the deen is not always what makes us feel most comfortable. Sometimes we will have to endure hardships. Sometimes we will have to go through difficult moments, right? With things that we didn't think would be so difficult. We didn't think it might be, you know, so challenging for us to, you know, for example, open a business or to invest in certain things. You can invest here, you can't invest there. And you look at so many people investing and making lots of money and you think, subhanAllah, why can't we do this? How come we can't benefit? Imagine if the Muslims could benefit from all that money and put it into the masjid. What guarantee do we have that we would actually take all that money and put it back into the society? No guarantee. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has limited what we can do and can't do, not because it's what be what's best for us sometimes, it's what's best for society. And that highlights you know, the main aspect of interest, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids interest because it makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. And it only diver or, or, or breaks up society and makes, as we see, you know, I remember yesterday during Iftar, some of us were talking about that. In some countries, you notice, Actually, you know, it was Suhoj this morning. It was during Suhoj, I was having Suhoj with some brothers. And subhanAllah, they were talking about how in some countries there's such an extreme gap. You have extreme poverty and extreme richness, right? And there's nothing in between, there's no middle class. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to uh, apply the rules of the Sharia ah across the board, inshaAllah. So here in Surah to Shura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins. Um, the surah, and in verse number seven, I wanted to point out, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لِتُنْذِرَ أُمُّ الْقَرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this Qur'an had come to us, and He revealed it in the Arabic language, and then He gave it to who? So that it would be a, a message to the Prophet sallallahu to warn the people of which city? The people of Mecca. So Umm al is the people of Mecca, وَمَنْ حَوْلَ Right? And those that are around it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the fact that the Qur'an came down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the language of the people that spoke that language over there where in Mecca, Umm al and the neighboring cities and towns and provinces. Does that mean that the Qur'an is only for the people of Mecca and Medina? No, it doesn't. I know a joke from a friend of mine, actually, by one of my dad's, you know, distant relatives, who's Pakistani. He's like, you notice all the prophets and messengers that came to, you know, maybe the Arab nations. And we don't have any report from any prophet or messenger that came to the people of Pakistan. That's because they're free of sin. And I was like, mashallah, is that what I'm that? It's very interesting. <laughs> so, you know, because he was saying the prophets and messengers were sent to people that were committing, you know, sin, extreme sins that were so displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he sent a prophet or a messenger to the people right and so he said you notice that it was there's no there's no record 
of any prophet or messenger sent to the people of Pakistan. <laughs> I was like, this is a lot of <laughs> It's a nice joke that stuck with me since childhood. Uh, SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions Umur Qura. And we notice in Mecca, there's a, a famous university there. What is it known as? Umur Qura, right? The Islamic University in Mecca, Umur Qura. <coughs> there are different names for Mecca as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Mecca also as Bakka with the ba, Bakka, and there's different names, like uh, the city of Medina, there's different names, previously it was known as Yathrib, and then it changed to Medina, Darul Iman, and Darul Taqwa, and many other names uh, that have been given to the cities of Mecca and Medina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that the Qur'an was sent to the people of Mecca, and those that were neighboring it, obviously that's where the people were residing, the Muslims were residing, residing the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it was given to them in the language that they understand, Arabic. Do we understand Arabic today? Do all of us understand Arabic? All of us? No, we don't. We don't all understand Arabic, right? Only some of us do. But we still follow the Qur'an. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're learning the Qur'an and learning it in a language that is easy for us to learn and to grasp. And it also is important for us to learn Arabic. So inshallah ta'ala, hopefully some of us take initiative to learn the Arabic language and teach it to our children as well. So that when we're reciting the Qur'an, when we're standing in salah, you know, when we're trying to grasp the full meaning of the Qur'an, we can only do so if we really listen to it and read it and recite it in the Arabic language because it's so much more powerful than when we simply go over it in English. From verses 16 to 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns not to dispute over Islam, right? Not to dispute over Islam. And this is important for us to try and understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights this here. What surah is this? Ashura, right? The consultation. I don't know about here, probably you do, because I don't know, every single masjid, I think, has like a general body meeting. But I remember growing up in Montreal, I have like, you know, nightmares of the general body meetings that took place in our masajid in Montreal. SubhanAllah, it was just like you'd go and it would, it would result in a fight. To the extent that there were some years that my father would tell us, stay home. As you know, the children were teenagers, he would say, stay home because it's safer for you to stay home. I was like, I could never understand it. My mom, as someone who accepted Islam, could never understand why is it that going to a meeting that's happening in the masjid about the betterment of the masjid and the community and the society ends up in something that could be violent, something that's dangerous, something where swear words are exchanged, where sometimes the police show up, where I've, <laughs> I've you know, seen uh, hockey sticks being thrown at each other. SubhanAllah, it's crazy, right? And that's what happens in our, or happened, I haven't seen it happen in a long time, but happened many years ago when the Muslims were trying to communicate and cooperate with each other to try and build a masjid. But what are we building really? A structure? Or are we building what we have here now? Right? Are we building just a building that has a roof and walls? Or are we building a place to learn, a place to have i'tikaf, a place for our children to come, a place for us to have fun and play, right? Like the ball court and, the, and, and playing badminton and so on, both young as well as adults. Are we having a place for our sisters to come and to gather and to sit down? Are we having a place to socialize where we can socialize as good friends, right? And not go into places that are haram for us to socialize. And subhanAllah, that's what that's actually... I don't want to say it because Brother Muhammad Zahid is here and he's probably going to think I'm trying to suck up to him or something. But subhanAllah, that's what I like about coming to this masjid. You know, since I've been here for a year now, every time I come, I meet nice people. I meet really nice people and I have the opportunity to teach what I've learned. And I've been given that platform, alhamdulillah, and it's good. And I noticed that the people here, when I'm away for two weeks, mashallah, the brothers, they come up to me and like, why do you always travel so long? Why do you always travel so long, right? <laughs> we missed our halakah for two weeks. How come you weren't here? And so subhanAllah makes you feel guilty and makes you feel as though you want to give back to, this, to the community. And that's exactly what we need. We need a community that's hungry. Hungry, not for the food, mashallah, we always get food. But we need a community that's hungry for knowledge, hungry for companionship, hungry for that social aspect, hungry for friends, hungry for good people. And that's, mashallah, I found it here. I've seen it here. There's always room for improvement. But subhanAllah, it's, it's a growing aspect of our community, insha'Allah ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here warns us against disputing over Islam. Now disputing with the non-Muslims 
as well as disputing amongst ourselves as Muslimin, those that believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and already have that faith and that iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so it's a lesson for us to refrain from disputing. And that's the beauty of our deen. Whenever you notice that two people don't see eye to eye and they're both Muslim and they're both disputing uh, some mas'ala or, an, or a matter that's Islamically related, the reason why they're disputing in the method that they're disputing, if it's not nice, is because of a lack of knowledge. That's, that's, simple. that's, the, that's a simple definition. It's a lack of knowledge. Because the scholars of the deen, they differ on such high levels. Like they go into minute detailed aspects of the deen. Like one word sometimes. And they dispute, they write each other letters and refutations. You don't know Arabic because, you know, the fact that you don't know Arabic, you probably haven't come across any of these books or any of these, you know, rasail, which are little, you know, letters that have been written back and forth. But the scholars write to each other, we have them, we read them how they argue amongst each other, but in such beautiful ways, right? They give their proofs and they debate and they, they talk to each other and they try to convince the other about a specific matter that is so minutely, you know, not even important to the average Muslim, but subhanAllah, when you look at the deen under a microscope, it's important. And so they, they have these disputes amongst each other in beautiful ways. And that shows us that the difference between the person who argues with another person and it starts to get rowdy or it starts to get, you know, uh, you know, people are angry and words are exchanged and sometimes it gets physical, that's simply because a lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge in the deen. Not lack of knowledge as in you're a dumb person. No, lack of knowledge in the deen. And the more that we know of this deen, the more we realize we don't know. Get it? The more we know of the deen, the more knowledge we acquire of Islam, the more we realize there's so much that we don't know. And that's the beauty of Islam, right? That it's like, a, it's like an ocean of, of knowledge. Think of the ocean, and you look at the ocean, subhanAllah, go to the Great Lakes, it's a simulation of the ocean. And you look out at the water, and you think if all of this water was to turn into ink, like we discussed last week or the week before, if all of the water was to turn into ink, it still could not write out all of the words or all of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's like infinity in terms of our eyesight at that moment, right? You can't see any further and it's all water. Yet it couldn't write out all of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses and has sent to us. And so we should refrain from disputing and having these arguments with Muslims. If someone starts to argue with you, and you want to argue back, stop yourself. Stop yourself and tell them, say, Jazakumullah khairan. Maybe there's a lack of knowledge on my part, but I didn't understand this. Well, I'll go and find out. And I, I do that too. Even sometimes people come to me with, with a matter that is so simple in the deen, like something related to wudu, or something related to you know, preparation of salah, or something on you know, how to find the direction of qibla. So simple and so basic that you know, we may have learned, many of us probably have learned when we were children, but they come to you and they argue with you, you say, Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. That in itself is showing that person that SubhanAllah, at this point in time, when you're really angry and you're coming to me, I don't have, I don't have the need to try and prove you wrong because I will just become angry as well. Right? That's just the way we are as human beings. So just thank them. And if you notice the person is not angry, then maybe try and advise them or try and tell them, you know what, I always thought it was this. And think of the example of those two boys, right? Those two children at the time of the Prophet wasallam. Who were they? Right? The grandchildren of the Prophet wasallam. What did they do? When they were making wudu, what did they do? What did they do? They asked the uncle if they could be taught how to make wudu properly, right? How? Watch us how we make wudu and tell us if we're doing this right. Show us if we're doing this right. And they did that because they noticed he was not making wudu properly. And so they asked him, can you watch us and show us, you know, tell us if we're making our wudu properly? And so they made wudu so perfectly that he realized he's making wudu, you know, uh, insufficiently, or there was a deficiency in his 
wudu. So that is a, a beautiful example of how to correct a mistake of someone else. In verse number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, the cause of any disaster or hardship that we face is because of our sins that we commit. Now I know some of you are probably going to start thinking of this and wondering how is it that it's because of our sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here, verse number 30, and whatever affliction befalls you, it is on account of what your hands have wrought or what your hands have earned. And uh, he pardons much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us a lot. So Allah mentions that the sins that we that we commit, or, or sorry, the yeah, because of the sins that we commit, hardship comes our way. So any time in our life that we think of, you know, subhanAllah, uh, this happened to me, right? You're driving and uh, maybe a rock hits your windshield and it cracks your windshield. And then you remember earlier today or earlier this week, you might have been doing something that you shouldn't have been doing. Or you might have said something you shouldn't have said. Right? So you think, subhanAllah, I need to purify my actions in order for things around me to go a little bit better. This is touching upon the uh, qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that we can sort of tweak our qadr, we can change our qadr by making dua, by performing good deeds, righteous deeds, righteous actions that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He's pleased with us, can send uh, good things our way, inshaAllah ta'ala. From verses 32 to 35, ships are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just before we touch upon this, uh, something I wanted to mention uh, regarding the verse that we just took. What about a person who does a lot of good deeds? A person who does a lot of good deeds, but then notices that they are still tested with a difficult moment. What about that person? Or what about the scholar? Right? Some of our teachers, I remember, we would learn from them and the whole world would travel to Medina just to sit and to learn a hadith or two from them in the time that they're there in Medina. And we used to take it, you know, take it for granted that we're sitting at the feet of these scholars. And subhanAllah, some of them are going through difficult moments in their life. Like I remember some of our shuyukh, they're suffering, you know, like one of them, stomach cancer, but not many people know it, right? Suffering from, from illnesses, suffering from, uh, you know, not being able to sleep, suffering from, you know, various things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them that we don't see the average person getting. These are very, you know, difficult things that have been placed upon the scholars of this deen. Why? Those are people that are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it that they get a hardship? It's a test. Eh? It's a test. It's a test to raise their ranks, right? Anyone else? To clean their sins. To clean their sins, good. Exactly, that's what I'm looking for, right? Tying in what you're saying, what, what everyone else is saying. Raising the ranks of, of, of the scholars, it helps them to get through what they're going through. The more hardship that they endure, the more closer they feel to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more sincere they are in their worship and their ibadah and their seeking of knowledge. Then we look at the prophets. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was tested severely. And he taught us that those that are closest to Allah will be tested the hardest. Those that are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go through the harder tests. And that's because they are capable of going through. لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا Do you think that the person whose iman is really low and weak is capable of going through the, hard, the hardest of tests? No, it's going to be difficult for them, extremely difficult. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests those that are closest to Him with the hardest of hardships. And that's because He knows they're capable of withstanding those hardships. It's just a matter of them trying to get through it, as we mentioned, a test. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our tests easy for us, even though our iman continues to increase. In verses 32 to 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the ships and how the ships are a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He highlights here the wind and how the wind pushes the ship. And you wonder to yourself, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even think of talking about ships in the Qur'an? Like, what would be the purpose of putting the ship in the Qur'an and talking about, you know, a ship or a boat that travels in the water? What's the point? Why, why does anyone think that? Example. Example of what? That it's a blessing from Allah, but how is it a blessing? Now, when you think of the ship, you look at this massive, you know, 
structure, and especially today. They're not made out of wood now, they're made out of steel. And, and the, the cargo ships, you know, one inch, two inch, three inches thick steel, but it doesn't sink. It floats on top of the water. And not only does it float on top of the water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights in this verse here, He sends the wind. Now, <coughs> traditionally, historically, we use the wind in order to push the ships, right? Yeah. Imagine if you built a ship and you put it into the water, but there was no wind from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where would the ship go? No, it wouldn't sink. It just would sail left, and then it would sail right, and then it would go front, and then it would come back, and sometimes it would stay where it is, and then it might come and you know approach the shore and bump into the shore, and then it might go out again. It wouldn't go in any direction. It would have no direction, nothing to steer it anyway. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the sending of the wind and the use of the sails, you can power that ship that boat and push it in a specific direction and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that those are vessels that he gave to us to use as transport to go from one place to the other to travel the world and today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us what we still use the ships but what else do we use the airplane right planes what do we need in order to fly the plane wind we still need air we still need air in order to travel that distance so subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights this in the Qur'an and mentions to us the ships <clears throat> and how without the wind, that ship would not be able to travel. It would not sail anywhere, it would just stay where it was and float off and not have any course in particular. And that's why we also saw the verse in the Qur'an Bismillahi majriha wa mursaha inna rabbi rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us to say this, why? Bismillahi with the name of Allah, this will take its course. It will go on its course. Whether it's a ship, whether it's a plane, whether it's a boat, whether it's a roller coaster, whether it's anything, any mode of transportation, with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will take its course. Without it, it won't. I remember there was a time way back in the day when I was, what, 18. I was driving back and forth, or 18, maybe 20. I was driving between Montreal and Toronto. And on my way from Montreal to Toronto, I started to have an issue with my car. It was a 1986 Toyota Corolla, right? And the gas cap was the problem. After, after troubleshooting so many things and consulting, you know, I was still am very interested in cars and the automotive industry. But subhanAllah, after troubleshooting so many things, thinking it might be, you, you know, at that time it was carburetor, didn't have fuel injection on the car. So a carburetor, maybe there's a clog somewhere. Maybe the, you know, the gas, the fuel pump, maybe it's a fuel filter. So I actually went to Canadian Tire, changed the fuel filters while I was here in Toronto. Did a bunch of things to the car. And only on the way back, after spending money to try and you know, resolve the issue, as I'm driving back, after another 80 kilometers, boom, the car would just stall. And I realized at that point in time, there's a, there's a problem with the pressure. Problem with the pressure in the tank. Why? Because the cap... After being old, it wasn't releasing the air from the tank. So the pressure was building up too much inside, creating a vacuum, not letting the, the uh, gasoline flow into the line, the fuel line, going into the carburetor and the engine. And so all I had to do was crack the cap a little bit and drive. That was it. Simple. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that without the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded that to move, to flow, to go wherever it wants, wherever it's commanded to go, it won't go. You can try everything and anything under the sun. You can change the engine, you can change the transmission, you can change the gas tank, you can change the fuel, you can change the fuel pumps, you can change the fuel filters, you can change everything. But a simple thing like air had stopped the car from moving. And that was it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights here that He gave those ships the ability to move. And today, alhamdulillah, we use, you know, the ships use diesel engines and they flow through the water, mashallah, at quicker paces. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still the one that controls that. <clears throat> In verse number, uh, verses 40 to 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us here that it's better to uh, forgive someone than to expect the punishment in return for what they've done. So if someone harms you, let's say they punch you in the arm and you got bruised, 
what is the recompense that they deserve? To be punched back in the arm and they get bruised, right? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's the concept that we use. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here shows us in the Quran, and we'll read through these verses inshallah, verses 40 to 43. The recompense for an evil is an evil like thereof. So someone who does something, their recompense is exactly what they did, is to be done to them, right? But whoever forgives and makes reconciliation, his reward is due from Allah. Verily, he likes not the zalimun, the oppressors, the polytheists, the wrongdoers, etc. Then in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And indeed, whosoever takes revenge after he has suffered wrong, for such there is no way of blame against them. So someone who has received what they deserve, then you know there's no blame, right? Because you've done what you've done. And the person who, who seeks the revenge, there's no blame upon them as well, because they didn't do anything wrong, they only gave back to that person what was taken from them. In verse number 42, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the way of blame or to blame is only against those who oppress men or people and wrongly rebel on the earth. For such there will be a painful torment. Then in verse number 43, Allah concludes by saying, And whoever is patient and forgiving, these most surely are actions due to courage. So those who are forgiving and patient, those who let go, those who don't hold on to, to grievances and things that have been done to them. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights it because it's absolutely important for us to try and understand that. Sometimes people harm us, do something against us, even family members, right? Sometimes they'll post something online that reveals something about you that you wanted to keep secret. I know this happened to someone I know and they came to me and they asked me what they should do. How can we clarify this issue? Someone posted a family member of theirs because they were jealous or they were upset with something that happened within the family. They posted something about them and their children online that they didn't like, right? That made them feel extremely bad. And so they wanted to know how to deal with that person that did that. And so obviously you can consult with them and tell them, you know, you can do this, you can do that, you can seek legal you know, assistance and so on. But the best thing is to try and resolve issues as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is your right as a Muslim, as a mu'min, it is our right to forgive the person. You hear that? It's our right to forgive them. So it's not their right that we forgive them, it's our right. I have the right to forgive you or to seek the revenge for, the, for what you've done. And so it's my right to seek forgiveness of that person, meaning you forgive them for what they've done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here, whoever is patient and forgiving, these most surely are actions due to courage. That this person has done something better, above and beyond the average person, that goes beyond the norm, and that will be rewarded, as he mentioned in verse number 41 and 42, that this person will receive the reward that they are deserving of. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Yes, you can go and seek revenge. You can go and get what you think you deserve. But what's more rewarding to you is that you forgive the person and you try to advise them through your forgiveness. Try to advise them and don't wait for them to come and seek forgiveness. I know a person asked me this just last week. Do I have to wait for someone to come and ask me to forgive them before I can actually forgive them? Or because they've done something wrong against me, can I simply forgive them? and not even tell them that I've forgiven them. Just through me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just communicate with Allah and tell Allah, yeah Allah, I forgive this person for what they've wronged me against or done against me, right? Yes, you can do that. And that's what we should do. We shouldn't wait for someone to come because we might forget. And then that person might be punished on the Day of Judgment because they didn't get back what they deserve. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may actually give them a punishment later on because of what they've done. To us. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all those that have wronged us in any way, shape, or form. Uh, what verse were we on, inshaAllah? 43. Okay, so verse number 51 to 53, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how the revelation came down. How does, how does revelation come to the prophets? There's three different ways, three different methods. What is the first one? Wahi, which is? 
Okay, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about wahi, but wahi is of three different types. Revelation is of three different types. How does it come? Through an angel, like you mentioned, right? An angel brings the message down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one. Second one is a dream, right? That's good. What's the third one? Behind the curtain. Someone mentioned it, behind the curtain, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will communicate with, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded him to tell us, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to pray 50 times a day. That was initially what was told, and then it was brought down to five times. And so that process was done in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but behind a curtain or veil. Basically, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was behind something or there was something that was blocking his view so he could not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though he's standing in front of him. So if I'm standing in front of you right now, or I'm sitting in front of you as I am right now, and we were to drop a curtain down, am I still sitting in front of you? Yes. So some people get confused with this. They say, well, how is it that Allah was in front of the Prophet sallallahu They were in front of each other, but yet he didn't see him. How didn't he see him? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided something to block his view from being seen, right? So there's three different methods, either through revelation from the angel down to the Prophet, or through uh, like a dream, or through uh, the communication of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet and Messenger from behind a, uh, a veil or a curtain. <clears throat> we move on to the next surah, Surah Az-Zukhruf, which is the 43rd surah of the Qur'an, and who can tell us what it means? Sorry? Gold ornaments, mashallah, because you all have your translations in front of you. In verse number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the mushrikeen and how they admit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their creator. And we, we spoke about this yesterday. So if you ask those who, who uh, worship idols, who is their creator, they will say that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that created them. In verses 26 to 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Ibrahim alayhi salam declares his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He declares his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then from verses 30 to 35, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions how uh, he gives an example of the luxuries of earth. The luxuries of earth. And this surah is a zuhruf, right? What is it highlighting? The luxuries of earth, right? Gold ornaments and so on and so forth, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> mentions that in these verses, how the examples of luxury uh, are, are there for us on earth. And I just want to go through a few of them, inshallah, because uh, we do have some time to go through them. And in verse number 33, And were it not that all people had been a single nation, we would certainly have assigned to those who disbelieve in the beneficial, uh, in the beneficent, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make a silver roof uh, of their homes over their heads and the stairs by which they ascend. Right? And if you look at it in a different translation, it mentions the beauty in using jewelry or the, 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 the gold and the silver that we enjoy so much silver in terms of the roofing, but to have elevators. In one of the translations, if you look at Sahih International, I believe it mentions elevators. What do we have today to go up and down in our homes? Well, we don't have elevators yet, but we have something similar. And in our buildings, we do. Those that live in apartment buildings are using elevators. MashaAllah, they have... You see, it's a blessing from Allah. People think we live in an apartment, we have less than the people that live in a house. The people who live in a house ask me, I, go, I take 36 or 38 steps to go from top to bottom in my house. It's like going up and down. I don't know why people design houses like this in Toronto. But subhanAllah, people who live in an apartment building, they simply push a button and go up the elevator. So simple, so easy, right? So it's a blessing. There's always blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wherever we look, we'll notice that we've been blessed. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the doors of their houses... Uh, and the couches on which they recline. So these are all luxuries that people will, will, will enjoy of this dunya, right? Having elevators, having, you know, beautiful roofs and nice homes, and now you're noticing instead of using the old shingles, they're now using those clay shingles. 
or the stainless steel equivalent of, of those shingles or you know galvanized steel. So all these beautiful things that we're trying to adorn our houses with. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the doors of our homes. And I know I know, you know, my dad once way back in the day, he wanted to change the door on the house and we went to this door store, right? The store that sells windows and doors. And subhanAllah, there are so many different kinds of doors. Beautiful doors and doors that had like, you know, gold plated handles and stuff like that. Why do you need that? Why on earth do we need it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions your couches that we recline on. And that's what we do. That's exactly what we do. We enjoy this dunya so much that sometimes it blinds us. Now, does it mean that these things are haram? No, it doesn't. We can enjoy from this dunya what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. You can enjoy it. You can benefit as much as you want. But let that wealth come into your hand and never get to your heart. Let it come to you only from the hand's length. Let it stay in your hands and not let it get to your heart. So you use your wealth as much as you want. Benefit from your wealth. Sit on your wealth. Enjoy it as much as you want. But when you hear the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you leave the wealth and you run to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> then we move on to verses, uh, verse number 36. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions whoever turns from Allah and then uh, leaves the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he likes and that he promotes, he will make shaitan and appoint shaitan for that person to be their friend. So shaitan will be their friend. Now you ask me a question? No, okay, I'm stretching, tired, mashallah. I know it's the last hour of the day, sometimes I need energy too, mashallah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions he will appoint for those who leave the, the, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will give them a, a nice friend, and that friend will be shaitan. So he will appoint shaitan to be their companion. In verses 52 to 53, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes how Fir'aun uh, disgraced Musa alayhi salam and how he insulted Musa alayhi salam. And he also highlights the aspect of the speech impediment because Musa alayhi salam had a speech impediment, right? And that's why when he made the dua, he said, Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa uqdatan min lisani, which means to literally untie or remove the, the knot from my tongue. So Musa alayhi salam had a speech impediment, just like some people have a lisp, or some people when they speak, they go over the words two, three times. That was how Musa alayhi salam, you know, spoke. And so he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remove this from me so that I could speak to Fir'aun and clearly deliver the message. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted him. Um, and he also, you know, made fun of Musa alayhi salam. Fir'aun made fun of Musa alayhi salam by saying, look at him, he's just, you know, this person who can't even speak properly, who doesn't wear golden bracelets, you know, he's not wearing gold. Again, the surah is highlighting beautiful adornments of this world, trying to make it seem as though because he's a person that claims to be a prophet, he doesn't have any of the bounties and beauties of this world, why would you follow him? And Musa alayhi salam actually convinced his people that because he doesn't speak clearly, because he doesn't wear jewelry, he's not someone that you should follow. And so the people turned away from Musa alayhi salam and continued to follow Fir'aun. In verse number 88 to 89, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the mushrikeen don't believe. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him and tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to respond with Salam. Respond with salam. The Prophet is complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't believe. They're not listening to the message. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, respond nicely. Respond nicely. Behave nicely. Let them see in you a beautiful example so that they would want to be just like you. And so that's an example for you and I as well when we're trying to deliver this message of Islam and when people talk to us so harshly about Islam and they come to us and get into our faces, make sure that we show them a nice example. Carry yourself as though what they're saying to you doesn't matter. You believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's more important than what they're saying and how they're defaming you or disgracing you or saying you're a Muslim, you're like this, you're a terrorist and so on. It doesn't matter because you know inside of yourself you're not that person that they claim you are. And so it doesn't matter to you and it doesn't bother you. We move on to Surah al dukhan which is the 44th Surah of the Qur'an and it means the smoke. 
And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah from verse 1 to 4. And he talks about the Qur'an and how the Qur'an was revealed. And how it was revealed on the blessed night, which we know is the night of Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, khayrun min alfi shahr. So here we're talking about the surah of the smoke, at dukhan and it ties in with this exact moment that we're going through, the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to catch Laylatul Qadr from amongst these last 10 nights of Ramadan. Never ever give up until the moon is seen. Never give up until the moon is seen. Okay? Strive extremely hard until the moon is seen. A lot of people on the last day of Ramadan, you know, you'll, they'll notice at Dhuhr time, that's it, the month is over. Those last few minutes, make sure you're here in the masjid. Tomorrow would be the day of Eid, for example. Make sure you're right here in the front row crying your eyes out. Because that is the moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Even though it's not the night, it's not Laylatul Qadr. But the Prophet ﷺ said to seek out the last moments of Ramadan because that's the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at our actions that we've done throughout the month and forgives us. So make sure that each and every one of us are not celebrating Eid in advance. Take advantage of the last minute, the last 30 seconds of Ramadan and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness. Um, then in verses 9 to 16, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions how He will send the smoke as we see in Surah Dukhan, He will send a smoke that people will notice and this smoke will fill the air and people will not realize, some people will realize this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and others won't. They won't realize that this is a sign. And then Allah will take the smoke away. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that He will send Batsha, right? If you look through the, uh, the Surah uh, and the verses, and that is referring to the day of resurrection. So he will send the smoke, then he will remove the smoke, and then afterwards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send the day of resurrection. From verses 17 to 33 is the story of Musa, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is highlighting the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And throughout this entire surah, he's highlighting signs. Smoke is a sign, as we just finished mentioning, and there are signs that he continues to highlight throughout this surah. Uh, verse number 38, this world was created with a purpose and with wisdom, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not as a time to simply just play and enjoy yourself. There's a reason why we were created, and that was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the ways that we constantly, uh, you know, remind ourselves to do so. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this world was not created as simply a place to play and to enjoy ourselves. How much more time until the event? 904, so... What time is it? 8.55 then? Okay. So we'll take five more minutes. That gives you five minutes, inshallah. That's smart type of math. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, uh, in verse number 56 to 58, that Jannah will have uh, no death. In Jannah, there will be no death. So a person will not die in Jannah. And the only death, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the verse, is, the, is that one death, which is the death that we will have leaving this world. So that is the death that we will taste. In Jannah, there is no death. It will go on and on and on, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned yesterday, and we discussed it yesterday. Um, in verse number 58, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights how the Qur'an flows so easily on the tongues. You notice when we recite the Qur'an, it flows nicely off our tongues very beautifully. And Allah is telling us this to try and have us understand and remind ourselves that this is the word that has been sent to us by Allah that is so easy for us to recite. Even the person that doesn't understand Arabic can recite it. Even the child that doesn't understand a single word of the Quran, doesn't know a single word of Arabic, can memorize the whole thing from cover to cover. That's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He reminds us of that here. Uh, at the end of Surah uh, Dukhan. We'll move on into the first few verses of Surah Jathiyah, uh, Jathia, which is the 44th, 45th Surah of the Qur'an. And this means uh, the kneeling, those that kneel down. Uh, from verses 1 to 15, we'll take chunks of the Surah. From verses 1 to 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the importance of understanding His signs. So the very first part of the surah, he's going over his signs, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only mentioning signs, but the importance 
of recognizing them, the importance of knowing that these are the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And how does it affect a person's life? And to change ourselves when we notice that this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In verse number 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, to let the believers forgive the disbelievers and to endure the hardships that they produce. So any hardship that the non-Muslims provide or put upon us as Muslims, endure it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse number 14, endure it, endure it, endure it, go through it and you will be patient through that test. It will pass inshallah ta'ala. Be patient with it and forgive, 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 forgive. Why? Because there are people who don't understand. There are people who don't understand, right? That are doing this to us as Muslims. In verses 16 to 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us we have our sharia to follow, not the sharia of Bani Israel, which is the Torah and the books of the past in general. So we follow our sharia and Allah is advising us not to follow the sharia of the, uh, of the people of the past or the books of the past. Verse number 24, the mushrikeen would tell the prophets that time is what destroys a human being. It is the one thing that destroys us, that takes our life away, time. When time is up, we're done, right? And it's easy to understand that. And subhanAllah, that is something that can actually trick people to think that time is actually what destroys us, but it isn't. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that takes our life away. Because Allah controls the time. He's the controller of the time. And He swears by the time because He created it. <laughs> Allah swears by the time. It's one of the shortest surahs of the Quran and we recite it in our salah when we don't have enough time and we're rushing and we recite Allah swears by the time. What awesome. Yet we're speeding through our prayers. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a deeper understanding of the short surahs of the Quran. And we'll conclude inshaAllah ta'ala which still gives us another seven minutes. Uh, we'll conclude with verses 27 to 29 how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the day of judgment every single nation when they are called upon to, qu to be questioned, they will then kneel down. Why will they kneel down? Why do you think people will kneel down? This is the surah. The kneeling, when people finally realize we will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will we be able to stand on our feet? Will we be able to actually carry, carry ourselves on our feet? When you hear terrible news, you get that phone call and you're standing up and someone tells you, are you sitting down? You know it's bad news, right? You know it's bad news. So imagine, when you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're about to be questioned about the things that you've done in your life, how will our legs feel? Those young imams that come and stand up and you notice the legs shake, the legs shake, because they're scared. And subhanAllah, that's, that's a trial, that's a test, it's difficult, but we get past it inshaAllah ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, uh, you know, the nations as they're called up for questioning, they will kneel down. Out of, uh, out of the severity of what they're about to face. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to continue to worship Him and to worship none other than Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to be forgiven throughout this month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us to continue to kneel down to none other than Him throughout this entire month of Ramadan and throughout the rest of our lives. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakana nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.